Today, we're talking about convicted murderer and fugitive Danilo Cavalcante finally being caught, Andrew Tate's removal and ban, an evil out of touch CEO argues unemployment needs to rise and workers need to feel pain because they need to be more thankful, we just witnessed an amazing cave rescue, a bunch of cold medicine just got exposed for not doing what it's supposed to do. We're talking about all that and so much more on today's brand new Philip DeFranco show. You daily dive into the news made possible by beautiful bastards like you who buy Wake and Make coffee. Ditch the burnt, bitter, overpriced coffee that you're used to and go to Wake and Make coffee.com where right now you can get 50% off your first bags. It comes out to like 50 cents a cup, so go do that. But we got a lot of news to talk about, so let's just jump into it. Starting with Andrew Tate was just banned, or more specifically, amid mounting pressure, Google removed Tate's The Real World app from the Play Store. So this app is advertised as a way for subscribers to learn about business and online entrepreneurship from multimillionaire mentors, claiming that for only $49.99 a month, recruits can learn how to make $10,000 in a month and escape the matrix. But many say that the app's actual purpose is to generate millions of dollars for Tate and his crew by recruiting young men into a pyramid scheme. Because reportedly, the primary way for users to make money on Tate's app is by recruiting other members through a quote affiliate marketing program, through which members are reportedly required to aggressively promote Tate and his sites on their social media, along with a distinctive sign-up link, where, notably, they can make a 48% sales commission on every new recruit who use their link. And all of what we're seeing now comes after one man from Australia, Nathan Pope, launched an online petition to pressure Apple and Google to remove the app from their stores, as well as trying to pressure the companies that process online subscription payments for the real world to stop working with the site on the grounds that it appears to be financially exploiting young men. And so the petition has over 9,000 signatures thus far, and while Google has pulled the app, Apple has yet to respond, which actually shocked Pope, who said in an interview, if they are being complicit in these potential crimes, it is important that the public is made aware. Also, beside the alleged pyramid scheme aspect of all this, you've seen people having this growing concern about the age demographic that Tate is trying to appeal to here. People sharing one video of a boy as young as six years old promoting the app. And one Tate associate has said that the prime age range for their app and Tate's other site, The War Room, is boys between 12 and 18. Additionally, another area of concern is the connection between the real world app in the war room, which of course is where we've seen reported leaked messages showing lessons to young men about making money by grooming women into online sex work. And with that, Jack Beeston, an attorney with the firm handling the civil case brought against Tate by his alleged victims in the UK, saying, It does seem as though Tate's online presence funnels people towards the real world, which in turn funnels people towards the war room. Of course, where minors are involved, this is deeply concerning. And well, for now, that is where that story ends. That is not the only bit of Tate news today. And that's because two of Tate's accusers in the Romania case have filed a protective order to keep their identities confidential, with them citing harassment from not only the brothers' fan base, but their legal team as well. But you know, that wouldn't be the first time we talked about Tate's alleged victims being doxxed, but this is the first time that we're seeing legal action being taken around that harassment, with the filing also alleging that the Tates hired two private investigators to look into one of the women's background and supply that information to an independent journalist and Tate associate, with the filing then going on to say that the Tates' attorney posted unredacted private information about the alleged victims to 105,000 Twitter followers, and all of that on top of hundreds of threatening messages from Tate fans and even people showing up to the victims' families' homes, with one of the women saying all of this has caused her immense stress, and adding, because of the constant hypervigilance and anxiety and fear I experience daily, I have trouble concentrating on even the smallest tasks, saying this has made it extremely difficult to secure regular employment. And as a result, I am extremely financially vulnerable and have trouble meeting even my most basic needs of food and shelter, with women asking the court to seal all identifying information in the future proceedings in order to try and stem the tide of harassment. But for now, on both fronts, we're gonna have to wait to see what happens. And then, Pennsylvanians can finally sleep tonight because Danilo Cavalcante has finally been caught. Right, that 34-year-old convicted murderer who was sentenced to life without parole last month for killing his ex-girlfriend. Then a week later, escaping from prison by crab walking up a wall and diving through razor wire. And after a nearly two week long game of hide and seek in Chester County, state police this morning described how he was caught, saying first a burglar alarm went off at a home within the search perimeter just past midnight. And while no one ended up being found there, it did bring a flood of cops to that area. Then a helicopter picked up a heat signal and began tracking it, but poor weather soon forced the aircraft to fly away. So tactical teams converged on the area, securing it until weather cleared. And then with a the chopper watching for any attempt to escape, the teams moved in and found Cavalcante, with him crawling through some underbrush to get away, carrying his 22 rifle with him, but the cops unleashed a dog on him, it barreled forward, sinking its teeth into his flesh, and you can see him soon after in cuffs getting escorted away by several officers. And thankfully, except for the bite wound, no one else got hurt, no shots were fired. And so that essentially brings us to the end, though there is this other small controversy, because you also have some people criticizing the officers for taking a photo op with Cavalcante positioned in front of a line of cops, with one holding his arms, another taking a knee and holding up his rifle in the air, and some canines looking badass up in the front. So there, when asked about it at a press briefing, the Lieutenant Colonel defended the picture, saying those men and women worked amazingly hard through some very trying circumstances. They're proud of their work. And then, Ariana Grande is in the news, and it's not because she helped break up a marriage, which of course was the last time she was making massive headlines, but this time it was because she was in a Beauty Secrets video from Vogue yesterday. And there, she dove into a very human conversation about her complicated relationship with beauty. And the part that seemed to have resonated with a lot of people was her emotional discussion about her previous use of Botox and lip fillers. For a long time, beauty was about hiding for me. And now I feel like maybe it's not. 
since I stopped getting fillers and Botox and maybe I'll start again one day, I don't know, to each their own, whatever makes you feel beautiful, I do support. But I know for me, I was just like, oh, I want to see my well-earned cry lines and smile lines. I hope my smile lines get deeper and deeper and I laugh more and more and I just think aging is like such a it can be such a beautiful thing. With many coming out in droves supporting the video, saying things like, I'm so glad Ariana was honest about her getting lip fillers and Botox, and what she said about aging is what young women need to hear. Saying she showed totally vulnerable transparency. Saying she's so real for sharing that she had that done. Others frustrated at the unreachable beauty standards women are expected to maintain. Saying she's barely 30 years old. The fact that she was getting tons of Botox and lip fillers before even turning 30 is insanity. Though, depending on where you go on social media, there were other people that were like, hey, why are we even talking about this? And arguing that she shouldn't be getting all this praise after the drama surrounding her relationship with Ethan Slater. Though for me personally, you know, I think we can look at this as two different situations. Like you can feel whatever you want to feel around Ariana and her relationship and all that. Like I personally don't care. Like from what I've seen, it's fucked up, but like it's not my life. But then too, there is something interesting and eye-opening about someone that does seem very beautiful. Talking about how even for them, like their self-image is so messed up and then the, the things that you might have to go through, I think that can be beneficial. Though then the cynic in me is like, yeah, but how much of this is a distraction to get away from the other story, but whatever. But hey, what are your thoughts on that? And then unemployment needs to be higher because workers have become too arrogant and need to be put in their place. That is literally what was argued during a summit by millionaire Australian property developer, Tim Gurner. Who I imagine just like woke up one day and was like, I already kind of look like one. Let's just fully lean into being an actual real life supervillain. I think the problem that we've had is that we've, you know, we, we have people decided they didn't really want to work so much anymore through COVID. And that has had a massive issue on productivity. You know, tradies have definitely pulled back on productivity. You know, they, they have been paid, paid a lot to do not too much in the last few years. And we need to see that change. We need to see unemployment rise. Unemployment has to jump 40, 50% in my view. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. I mean, there is a, there's been a systematic change where employees feel the employer is extremely lucky to have them um, as opposed to the other way around. So. It's a dynamic that has to change. We've got to kill that attitude and that has to come through hurting the economy. Yeah, how dare workers think even for a second that they provide any value to their employers. Everyone knows that people are inherently worthless if they aren't working and contributing to the economy, especially the economy of my wallet. So really they should be thanking the corporate overlords because without them, people wouldn't have any value. Yeah, we need more pain and fear to put people back in their places. Ugh. Right, so unsurprisingly, that horrible fucking take got a ton of backlash, with one Australian member of parliament even writing, these are comments you'd associate with a cartoon supervillain, not the CEO of a company in 2023. We even saw politicians politicians from other countries chiming in with that, including AOC, who tweeted, reminder that major CEOs have skyrocketed their own pay so much that the ratio of CEO to worker pay is now at some of the highest levels ever recorded. Others also noting this isn't the first time that Gurner has shown the public what an insanely out of touch idiot he is. With this being the same man who went viral back in 2017 for literally saying that millennials will not be able to afford their own houses because they buy too much avocado toast. Man, I'm not saying do it, but just the, the more he talks, the more punchable his face looks. But yeah, I guess just uh, another unfortunate fortunate daily reminder that just because you have a lot of money, it doesn't buy you class or decency or even save you from being a fucking moron. And then, for the past week, the world's been watching to see if one American man can escape the depths of the earth alive. A 40-year-old veteran cave explorer, Mark Dickey, co-led a team to map a new passage in the Morja Cave, one of the deepest in southern Turkey. But then, 3,200 feet below the surface, he suffered gastrointestinal bleeding that left him frail and incapacitated. With him saying he kept throwing up blood, and then my consciousness started to get harder to hold on to, and I reached the point where I was like, I'm not gonna live. But then, on September second, news of his impending doom reached the surface and an international team of at least 200 aid workers and cave experts launched a rescue operation. And they reached him around the middle of last week and began the slow, long ascent up a zigzagging path higher than two Empire State Buildings. First, they put him on a stretcher since he can't climb and then they wrapped him up in a thermal blanket since it's wet and cold, about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Then they began hauling him out, but it was also far from simple. Right? Some passages were so tight they had to be widened to fit the stretcher through. And his condition worsened so much that at one point medics and rescuers had to give him a blood transfusion down in the depth. They were passing waterfalls, deep pits, the cave even flooded with over three feet of water at one point. But then finally, this week, they maneuvered him through the last few hundred feet of the cave, sometimes struggling just to keep him level during near vertical portions of the narrow climb. And just past midnight local time, a stretcher emerged from the final exit carrying one very tired middle-aged man with a huge grin on his face. And that man telling reporters, It is amazing to be above ground again. I was underground for far longer than ever expected with an, uh, with an unexpected medical issue. It's been one hell of a crazy 
crazy adventure. With him now reportedly in the ICU at a nearby hospital, and he's doing well. And then, y'all, who hasn't felt the effects of the cost of living in recent years? And with credit cards, personal loans, medical bills, it's all too easy to fall into or further into debt. And I mean, how many of you wish that there was another solution to paying off your debt? Well, thanks to today's sponsor, PDS Debt, they have customized debt savings options for anyone struggling right now. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, listen up. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low monthly payment based on what you can afford. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies and get this, there is no minimum credit score required. You can pay off your debt in a fraction of the time, saving thousands in interest and fees. And PDS Debt is giving you beautiful bastards of free debt analysis just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash DeFranco. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest ways to take care of your debt. So just go to pdsdebt.com slash DeFranco and get your quick and easy debt assessment today. It's time to take back control of your life and live for you, not your debt. And then, are you or someone you know obsessed with Taylor Swift? Would either of you like that to somehow be a job so maybe it feels less weird? Well, baby, do I have good news for you. Gannett, the largest newspaper chain in the United States, just posted a job listing for a Taylor Swift reporter. You might have to hide some of your idol worship in the interview because they say that they're looking for someone with a voice but not a bias, as well as five years of experience and the ability to satisfy people's undeniable thirst for all things Taylor Swift, with that position specifically writing for USA Today and the Tennessean, which is the paper in Nashville where Swift began her career. And this is kind of stand out for a few reasons. The first being, while it is normal for outlets to employ music reporters or entertainment reporters, it's just rare to see someone whose beat is exclusively a single artist. Though also in the case of Swift, her cultural and economic importance is undeniably meteoric. I mean, she broke Ticketmaster, she caused an earthquake in Seattle, she even grew the US economy. And now her globe-spanning Eras tour could bring in $1.4 billion or more in sales according to Polestar, the highest in music history by far. And all of that also boosting her entire body of work, putting 10 albums on the Billboard 200 this year alone. And then last night, she took home nine trophies from the MTV Video Music Awards, which I just found out is still a thing that happens. With all this leading the Times to conclude that Swift has achieved a level of white-hot demand and media saturation not seen since the 1980s heyday of Michael Jackson and Madonna. Or as Robert Thompson put it, you cannot be conscious in the United States without on some level having to come to grips with Taylor Swift. But also with this, there is some controversy and criticism. With some critics arguing not only has Swift's cultural dominance gone too far, saying Swifties often see her as this immovable cosmic force, someone who's more than just human. But also as we're seeing with this reporter job, it arguably crowds over everything else that doesn't have to do with Taylor Swift or the entertainment industry. Right? Notably, this is happening as we've been watching investigative reporting jobs in the local journalism industry absolutely get wiped out for years now. With one Tennessee reporter pointing out that while Nashville's getting a Taylor Swift reporter, Memphis has zero investigative journalists from Gannett. And last December, Gannett cut about 6% of its roughly 3,400 person U.S. media division. Right? So many fear that the media industry is making this shift away from so-called real news and reporting on matters that are kind of softer culture and entertainment content. Right? Things that generate clicks rather than, you know, deep investigative pieces and uh, things like corruption. But also with this, you had Kristen Roberts, Gannett's chief content officer, defending the listing yesterday, saying the USA Today Network is committed to serving its readers with essential journalism and that, quote, includes providing our audience with content they crave. But then you also had people seeming to turn it into kind of a race thing, with some arguing that while Swift is worth paying attention to, other stars are just as big, like Beyonce, whose Renaissance album has resonated with Black and LGBTQ people in particular, and one music writer saying, I think the question that comes to mind for me is which fandoms and which moments of connection are taken more seriously. And Taylor Swift's fandom is very white. It's a lot of white women. And then, have you ever taken a decongestant cold medicine when you're sick and you're stuffed up and you thought, like, this is just, this is not helping? Well, it turns out it's because it literally wasn't helping. And that's not my opinion. That is what an FDA advisory panel said yesterday, ruling unanimously that a decongestant ingredient used in many common over-the-counter cold meds is totally ineffective. With the ingredient in question being called phenylephrine, and it's found in a ton of the most popular brand name products Americans have been using for decades. And it's including versions of Sudafed, Tylenol, NyQuil, Theraflu, Mucinex, and others. In fact, according to the FDA, the decongestant is used in at least 250 products that were worth almost $1.8 billion in sales last year alone. But after reviewing more recent comprehensive studies, the FDA panel determined that the ingredient is basically useless and ineffective as a decongestant when taken orally. And the panel acknowledging this determination marks a major change from the previous stance of the agency, which notably affirmed the efficacy of this ingredient as recently as 2007, and with that saying it should be reclassified and lose its status as safe and effective, though it did still say that the product was safe. Now, as far as what happens from here, the panel's decision isn't binding. It's just a recommendation that the FDA now consider this before making a final decision, but the agency does usually follow the recommendations. And if it does in this case, it could result in many of the most popular products being removed from stores entirely. But also, it could be a while before we get a final determination, and even then, the process could be drawn out by lawsuits and other pushback from drug companies and their powerful lobbyists. Because, of course, that is what happens when in a year you have 1.8 billion dollars in sales. And then, here's a concerning truth. 
Poverty in the U.S. absolutely skyrocketed last year, with a new report from the Census Bureau finding that the poverty rate soared from 7.8% in 2021 to 12.4% in 2022. And this notably as key COVID aid programs expired and inflation rose to a 40-year high. I mean, y'all, this is the biggest one-year jump ever recorded. And the kids, they were the ones especially impacted, with child poverty rates more than doubling from a record low of 5.2% in 2021 to a whopping 12.4% the following year, which is horrifying. More than one in every 10 American children are living in poverty. Right, and these increases are especially stark because they come after two years of major drops in poverty that were mostly due to the sweeping social safety net programs put in place during the pandemic. That including stimulus checks, enhanced unemployment and food benefits, increased child tax credits, rental assistance, and more. But when most of those benefits expired last year, families were left to deal with it alone as record high inflation drove up prices. And when we knew things were going to head in this direction, we talked about it on the show to see firsthand the impact it's had is wild. Right, the increased cost of living also drove up the poverty threshold, which is determined by the cost of essential goods such as food and housing. And this also doesn't just hurt low-income Americans. Median household income also fell by 2.3% in 2022. What's more, this whole situation could get even worse as the very last few government relief programs wind down. You know, because student loan payments will resume again next month for the first time in three years. Also, another policy that's expired is one that temporarily prevented Americans enrolled in Medicaid from being dropped, which was a move that plummeted the number of uninsured Americans to a record low 7.9%. And in just the few months since the enrollment unwinding began, at least 6.4 million people have had their coverage ended. And then this fall, funding for child care providers is set to expire, which could hurt many of the families that are already the most impacted by all of this even more. And so all of this is really fucking grim. And this, as experts know, that this Census Bureau report is especially notable because it really underscores how the government really does have the ability to lift so many people out of poverty. But it, or at least certain people in it, just truly don't care. With one expert explaining that the data tells a story of what could have been. Saying the pandemic showed that we could stand up policies that could help families. These numbers underscore how much poverty is a policy choice. And then, it's always weird to see two shitty people that you don't like hanging out. And that's what we're seeing with this now long-awaited meeting between Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un finally happening. There, unsurprisingly, Kim voiced his support for Russia's war in Ukraine, saying Russia has risen to a sacred fight for its sovereignty and security, and saying North Korea supports all Putin's decisions. The two also seem to have a twisted sense of irony and called Russia's war a war against imperialism, which is just fucking amazing considering the entire war is about rebuilding a Russian empire. With this, it's also believed that Putin's trying to secure that one thing that North Korea actually has a fuck ton of, weapons and munitions. And sure, they're all a bit dated at this point, but they're on par with how Russia's army is currently equipped. And they'll likely need all that ammunition if they want to stop Ukraine from making any more advances. Because while Ukraine's counteroffensive has been underway all summer, it finally is making some serious gains. Now, not necessarily in total area of territory, but in key strategic regions, such as in the east, where they've captured a key town just a few miles away from the outskirts of Donetsk, which is the capital of one of its longtime breakaway regions. And it hasn't just been successes on the front lines. Over the past 24 hours, Ukraine has also managed to launch a series of missile attacks on Russian naval facilities in Crimea. And that attack has reportedly damaged a pretty large Russian submarine as well as a key transport vessel alongside possibly smaller boats, not to mention actually damaging the facility itself. However, that attack has also highlighted another controversy that's been going on lately, Ukraine's relationship with Elon Musk and Starlink. And that's because Starlink reportedly had an outage shortly after the missile attacks began, leading to more accusations that he may be helping Russia because of his opposition to U.S. involvement in Ukraine. Now with that, though, for his part, Musk claimed that Starlink is never turned on above territory controlled by Russia due to U.S. sanctions, and saying that Ukraine can't just call U.S. companies in the middle of the night and demand changes especially when there's an outage like last night. And also, muddling the waters is that Starlink seems to have gone down platform-wide, not just over Ukraine. Although notably, the issue has since been resolved. So for that, it kind of comes down to whether you believe that Musk would tank his entire Starlink network to make Ukraine's attacks on Russian facilities harder. But I'll leave that part up to you. And in the meantime, we're going to keep an eye on this story. And then, let's talk about yesterday, today. Because while we covered so many news stories in that extra large show yesterday, there was one story that just took over the comment section. With that being the family that was held at gunpoint while they were trying to save their dying dog. We all just sounding off. Even with video proof, the police were lying through their teeth. I know I would rather believe in the family trying to save their dog. My heart goes out to the family of Stella. You can see how much they loved her and that cop can rot in hell. People saying the cops escalated the situation. Some saying I hope that the family is able to sue the police department. Saying they were made to watch their dog die because of a heartless excuse of a human that shouldn't be on the police force. Many of you expressing rage and sadness. And while many were shocked by the story and video, a lot of people said, you know, this is a known thing. Saying New Mexico native here, this is not a surprise. Growing up, we made jokes as kids that you don't worry about bad people killing you, the cops will. Many calling for people to be fired, for there to be police reform, saying this is a fantastic example of why every officer needs body cams on at all times. But also, there were some of you who didn't really have sympathy for the family, or at the very least, the dad, writing things like, leopards ate my face moment for that dude and the dog. He went and posted, I back the blue, I teach my son to back the blue, and that if you just listen, follow directions and do what the cop says, that nothing like this would ever happen. But it happened to me. Like, yeah, dude, that's what the fuck we've been saying, that cops will do this shit even if you comply. And that is where today's dive into the news is gonna end. But for more 
more news you need to know, I got you covered here. You can click or tap, or I got links in the description. Also, maybe grab yourself a bag, Awake and Make Coffee. You can click or tap there, or in those links in the description. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you right back here for more news tomorrow.